All right, we'll be starting in one minute. So if you could please return to your seats. We'll be starting here in about one minute. Thank you all for coming back for uh, the second group of candidates running for governor. Uh, again, I'm going to turn it over to County Executive Chris Avely. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for being patient as uh, we shifted out here. Um, uh, we got a great group of uh, responses from our first candidates, and I would expect uh, the same from four more uh, great minds and passionate Wisconsinites. Uh, I want to, I know I said this before, thank uh, all the elected officials and candidates, not just on stage, but in the audience, uh, because as I mentioned before, as you all know, uh, it has never been uh, a more often thankless job to spend the amount of time, go to the amount of events, knock on the amount of doors, be misrepresented sometimes, misquoted sometimes, you know, not by our friends currently in the, uh, in the room <laughs> of the press, but lesser uh, reporters, and your commitment and perseverance to do it anyway. And I just, uh, I don't like to let the moment pass without acknowledging that I appreciate that, and I, I don't take it for granted. And this race has been better for it. Uh, so the uh, uh, rules, uh, all the candidates was, were given, like, again, the questions ahead of time. Each will start uh, with a two-minute opening statement, uh, and then we'll have a few uh, show of hands questions uh, to whether or not you agree with the statements. And then during the questions, uh, the formal questions after that, each candidate has a minute 30 uh, to respond to questions. Our timekeeper, and you'll all be used to timekeepers, is uh, Tia. Uh, who uh, at a minute 30, at a minute 15, will give you your 15 second warning, and then she'll hold up the stop and try and make sure you stop. Uh, and uh, 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 we'll, uh, uh, we'll uh, go from there. So, um, uh, oh, here, one other detail. As we do the questions, we will rotate through who gets the first answer. And so we'll start uh, with mail and then move on down, and then Matt will have the first answer to the next question, et cetera. Uh, so, first part, uh, two-minute opening statement. Aylin. You, you get to go first? You get to go first. All right. How are we all doing? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. So, we're in the second round, and someone asked me earlier today, how did we get chosen to be with the four and the four? And I don't know that I answered that question, but uh, I'm glad to be here with you uh, today. My name is Malin Mitchell. I am uh, one of 20,000 candidates for governor of the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> But in all seriousness, I am one of eight. I think we have now um, a lot of great people, but I, I feel like I'm the best candidate uh, to win this thing and bring it home. Uh, I got to meet a lot of you when I ran for lieutenant governor in 2012, where I got 1,156,520 votes-ish. <laughs> but I remember that number because I know the number it takes for us to actually have to win this thing. And uh, it's, it's more than the 50 plus 1% uh, that, we, that we haven't gotten in the past. So. Uh, I reside in, in, uh, in Fitchburg, which is a little south suburb of Madison. Uh, my wife, she would love to be here, but she's a flight attendant for Delta, so she's flying in friendly skies. I have a, uh, my, my oldest daughter, uh, it, my oldest is my daughter, who is a, a sophomore at UW Oshkosh, and I have a son who's a freshman, uh, public school starting uh, high school. So um, I have a family. I've been a firefighter for 20 plus years in the city of Madison. And uh, my older brother's a firefighter in Atlanta, Georgia, and my younger brother's a firefighter in uh, St. Paul. So giving back, being part of the community is within my DNA. And that's what I think it takes and what we need in the governor's mansion, to actually have someone who gives a damn about people. And we don't have that right now. 
Uh, I've spent the majority of my life giving back to others. As firefighters, we respond to people in our community on the worst days of their lives. And when people are at their worst, we have to be at our best. So that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to bring to the government. I want to make sure we have a government that puts people uh, over politics, people over bad policy, even people over party. Because it's time for us to get back to the state of Wisconsin that cares about each other. And now is my time to stop, because she told me when she get, if, if she says stop and I don't stop, she'll come up here and kick me in the head. So <laughs> I thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm, I look forward to having the debate today. All right, Matt. Thanks very much. I'm Matt Flynn, running for governor. It's good to be here. I'm a Navy veteran, uh, former chairman of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. My wife Mary and I have been married 41 years, and I've lived in the city of Milwaukee most of my adult life. We have our home a few miles north of here on the east side of Milwaukee. So it's good to be here, and it's good to be here with my friends here, tourists from out of town who are coming to see what Milwaukee's like. <laughs> anyway. I am running for governor because I'm not going to stand by and watch our democracy destroyed. Donald Trump, for bribery and blackmail, has betrayed our country to the Russian KGB murder of Vladimir Putin. And we need some strong democratic governors who stand up to him because the Senate and the Congress appears unable to do that. In, in, in Madison, Scott Walker is a slave of his donors. What he's done is he's frozen wages, corrupted our government, polluted our water, and we've got to replace him. Now, uh, I'm going to stand up to those billionaire elites in the Republican Party, but I'm also going to stand up to the identity politics elites in the Democratic Party who subvert democracy and try to control our nominations. I'm not putting up with that. It's up to the people. The other thing I'm going to say is this. The principal issue for me is local control. The county is the primary unit of government of services that touch the most people. And by uh, local control, I mean the county board and not as much power on the county executive. The way it works around, no, the way it works, the way it works around this state, and there's 72 counties, I'm a 72 county candidate, is this. The proper function is Scott Walker should not be interfering, stripping control of county boards. There never should have been a referendum, that humiliating lowering of pay, that's eventually only going to let it be open to rich people to serve. And we are going to restore a proper balance. We're going to get Madison out of it. We're going to get the Republican Party out of it. There's going to be a strong county board and a good, strong executive who will use the veto power when appropriate. I'm looking forward to these questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kelda Royce, and I'm running for governor because I love Wisconsin. I want Wisconsin to be a place of opportunity and fairness where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. We can be the best place to raise a family and the best place to grow a business, things that I've been so lucky to have the opportunity to do. I think we need somebody who shares our progressive values, who has a commitment to strong public education, to health care for all, protecting our natural resources and clean air and clean water and good government, and building an economy where everyone can share in prosperity. These are our shared values. I think we need some, a governor who is ready to govern on day one, somebody who has experience reaching across the aisle even when it's tough on issues like reproductive rights, as I did when I was executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin and helped to pass the first pro-choice law in 30 years in the state through an anti-choice Republican-controlled assembly. As I did when we, <laughs> we might have to do some more passing of laws on reproductive rights, I'm sorry to say, and somebody who served in elected office and helped make Wisconsin a leader in banning BPA, a toxic chemical in children's products. Someone with legal skills, as I have in my time and as a law student working on the Wisconsin Innocence Project on criminal justice reform. We need somebody with those actual skills of governing, making tough decisions, working with people with whom we disagree and finding common ground. But most of all, if we want Wisconsin to be a place where everyone can thrive, we need a new governor. And that means we need a candidate who can win. Over the last several months, uh, all, we've got eight great people who are putting themselves on the line, and every single one of them are people I respect and admire, and every single one of them is going to have a role to play, just like all of us in this room are going to have a role to play, to put our state back on the right track. But our campaign has built momentum from the very, very beginning. We just passed the million-dollar mark in terms of fundraise. We have the resources needed. 
We have the excitement and the energy of the key groups of voters. We need young voters, women voters, and voters around the state who are progressive. That's how we're going to win this election, and I ask for your vote on August 14th. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, Josh. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Chris, for hosting. Thanks for everyone for coming out here today. My name is Josh Paid, uh, and I'm also one of the candidates for governor. And I'm from Kenosha, but uh, I now live here in Milwaukee with my, my beautiful wife. And we are proud to be a part of all the good things that are happening in Milwaukee and all the potential that Milwaukee can be. Uh, we, we, we walked here, we lived right, right in the third ward, and it's good to be a good neighbor here in Milwaukee and along with some fellow neighbors as well. Like I said, I grew up in Kenosha and uh, lost my father when I was young and my family was struggled in poverty. So I, we moved and I, I was given an opportunity to work and I worked across the entire state of Wisconsin. I lived in northern Wisconsin, I worked in the Fox River Valley and lived in central Wisconsin in the western part, learning how to be a businessman working in the grocery industry for a family company. I, once my siblings were old enough, I worked my way through school and law school and I dedicated myself to public service because too many families like mine were falling through the cracks. I got into this race because Wisconsin is ready for a new chapter and a new vision in our politics. We're only going to win if we empower all of our citizens and we present a vision of innovative policies that shows everybody in Wisconsin what we can have in the next 10, in the next 20 years. We're sitting here in Milwaukee and our current governor has built his entire career on resentment across the state against this fine city, against one city against another city, against rural, against urban. We're not going to win until we have the courage and the ability to bridge those divides, to go to every part of the state and understand how each region's economy is impacted and interconnected to every other region's economy, to understand that Milwaukee County is also part of the Milwaukee metro area and giving the, the tools for people to live in Milwaukee, to work in the suburbs, and vice versa. We need to do this part as part of a broader vision that goes beyond just fixing the problems that the current governor is giving us and presenting a vision that people can get motivated by, get inspired by, get their neighbors to get inspired and bring everyone out to the polls to win in November. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, uh, for all of that. I, uh, I'm going to repeat something I said uh, ahead of uh, the last round just because it premises what a lot of uh, uh, sort of the, def uh, the, the shared feature of uh, most of the questions we're talking about, uh, and that's uh, issues in how the state funds local government. Uh, one thing that any municipality, not just in the county, but across the state has in common with each other is uh, in every set county, all 72, uh, over the last 10 years, we are sending more uh, local taxpayers to the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the state biennial budget gets bigger and bigger every year, and what we get back is flat or declining. You don't need to be an economist to know that this is not uh, a, a formula for success. And recently, uh, the Wisconsin Policy Forum put out a report that was uh, pretty uh, fantastic and well done, but pointed out that Wisconsin is unique in the United States. It is the only state in which there is not a mechanism, a set percentage or algorithm that determines if local government grows what they send to the state through new jobs, new taxes, et cetera, more spending, uh, that there is a clear connection to what gets returned. Um, absent that, there's much, not much incentive for the state and local government to collaborate. Uh, so we're going to start with a few uh, show of hand statements to, to, to say a baseline. I have a feeling this will be relatively easy, uh, but raise your hand if you agree with these statements. First, Milwaukee is the economic engine of the state of Wisconsin. All right, thank you. <laughs> 100 percent, sorry. What if, what if we said no? Would you, we have to leave? Uh, no, you can still say. Uh, the best way to grow the state budget uh, revenue is by supporting local communities' ability to invest in economic growth and create jobs. Next, uh, the entire state of Wisconsin benefits when the most populous county has a robust and prosperous economy. Uh, and then finally, Milwaukee sends more in taxes to the state than it receives back relative to other local governments. And as a hint, you may have seen the chart uh, on the way in. <laughs> so, uh, 
The state-local government financial relationship has been under stress for several decades. Milwaukee County state aid has remained flat, while expenses for state-mandated services continue to rise. Uh, Milwaukee County officials have very limited options uh, to raise our own revenue outside of the property tax, which is capped. So the first question, uh, how would you approach this dynamic as governor? And we'll start with uh, Matt Flynn. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I don't like the property tax. It's a regressive tax. I don't like the sales tax. That's a regressive tax. The income is a more progressive tax, and those are the revenues that the state harvest and should be returning. Chris, the two things I would look at are unfunded mandates for courts and, me and mental health services. I think the court unfunded mandate is about $40 million a year. Uh, the me uh, mental health, maybe $60 million. And I would look to returning that as a funded mandate to the extent we can in the state budget, but quite substantially. Right now, and I'll tell you something, I've gone around this state, appearing in, in almost all the counties, and you would be surprised at the perception out there. A woman raised her hand up in dresser, and she said, uh, when are we going to stop sending all that money to Milwaukee? And I said, it would it surprise you to know that Milwaukee uh, gets, uh, sends uh, well over $400 million a year to the state and gets less back, and no one believes that around the state. Truly, no one believes that. With a governor from Milwaukee virtually all his entire life, I know it. And so what I'm going to do is, first of all, take a look at the unfunded mandates and start funding them to, uh, fully, if possible. But uh, as you know, I've advocated getting rid of Foxconn, and I've outlined a plan, taking back the billion in Medicaid money, taking $800 million in train money, and getting rid of the manufacturer agriculture exemption. That's a lot of money, and a lot of that money is going to start coming back in, in shared revenues. And a lot of it is going to be used to help fund partially or fully unfunded mandates. In this case, I'm referring to courts and mental health services, but there are others as well. Tell that. So we need to restore local control in Wisconsin. We have this great tradition of home rule, allowing communities to make decisions about things that they're closest to, you know, whether it's schools or roads or local projects. And there's accountability when the local decision makers can make decisions, and if they make ones that the local residents don't like, they can get voted out of office. That's how local control works. That link has been broken. It's been broken by, over a period of years, uh, politicians at the Capitol in Madison taking more and more of that control, saying, we're not going to let you raise your own resources, whether it's levy limits, whether it's taking away the ability to do regional transportation planning. Um, and we're also not going to let you make your own decisions. City of Milwaukee, you want to build trust between your police force and communities of color? We don't care. We're not going to let you have a residency requirement. And as a consequence, just a few years later, now we've got uh, a third of the police officers, give or take, living outside of the city of Milwaukee. So we need to let local communities, whether it's Milwaukee or uh, small communities all over the state, have more of a say and repair that link between local decision makers um, having control over policy and being able to fund the needs of the community. We also need to have a fair funding model for the state that makes sure that Milwaukee and other communities of every size around the state get a fair share of the money that they're paying in and have our needs met. Josh? Thank you. You know, uh, being a little bit of a, of a policy wonk, n nerd, I guess you could say, um, it's important for states to have a vibrant, independent, prosperous city that, that drives the economic engine of the entire state. If you look at other examples of other states, prosperous states have prosperous cities, and that's what we need here in Wisconsin. And that begins by allowing Milwaukee first to, to have more power to govern itself, to create policies that can raise revenue, that can tackle problems. The second thing is restoring the, the shared revenue and understanding that that must be part of a policy that's sold statewide that shows every community how they're interconnected as, as different economies and different regions. And showing that out so that there's credibility so that uh, someone from, from Eau Claire doesn't feel like their tax dollars are just going straight to Milwaukee. We need to sell that across the state. And finally, and I've, I've been a, a long advocate of what I call government 2.0. And that's about modernizing and innovating at the government level. What I want to do is establish a technology, chief technology officer and a set of platforms that cities can use to innovate, crowdsource, and co correspond with the state government in new ways that, that eliminate a lot of the, the barriers between the, the capital and the county. Uh, there's, there's lots of things that are happening in, in the 
policy space on this, and that's one thing where I think we as a state can set the example in the country of how government can operate in the 21st century in a way that uses every dollar in a transparent way and provides credibility for how that dollar is spent. Ellen? You know, we need to uh, empower our local governments, local officials, and not handcuff them. Um, the city of Milwaukee in 2015 sent close to $1.3 billion to the state of Wisconsin and Madison and got back about $227 million. So yeah, your first question was, is Milwaukee the economic driver of the state of Wisconsin? Well, the answer has to be yes just by pure metrics and money and dollars. So, you know, I, I, it's funny, Republicans and, and Governor Scott Walker, they always talk about local control and getting rid, of, getting rid of local mandates. And when they're in office, they do the exact opposite. Like, they take away local control. They actually put in more mandates and, and, and actually um, handcuff local municipalities, towns and villages to do their jobs, and that is to take care of their community. So what I would do first, and I, I think a lot of these questions that we got sent to us, you're going to hear me say the word local control a lot because it's, it is about the city, uh, uh, local, county governments being able to actually take care of themselves. They know what's best. The county board, your city board knows what's best for those municipalities. So Madison has to get out of the way and we have to give money back. We have to be able to allow folks to increase their levy and take care of the municipalities because they know better locally than we would in Madison. So first thing I would do, one of the first things I would do as your governor is make sure we establish and give back local control to municipalities and elected officials that you like to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to uh, lead into this next question with uh, two good examples. I mentioned them before. I hadn't mentioned them in the beginning, but of what some of the impact, the real world impact of that trend, the long term trend, we're sending more to Madison, getting less back. Uh, the transportation budget uh, at the state level obviously has been the subject uh, of a lot of controversy. Uh, in Milwaukee County, our funding uh, for transit, transit aid, is at the same level it was at the tail end of the Doyle administration. Uh, and needless to say, things have not gotten cheaper. So Milwaukee County has moved more property tax levy to backfill because we don't want to make it harder for the 150,000 rides every single day, 40% of which are people who don't have a car and they're getting to their job or they're going to UWM or MATC. Uh, we also have uh, a child support department like every single uh, county. Uh, counties are where child support happens and ha why is this important as I don't have to say to Democrats because when child support agencies work well it means more parents, single parents with kids getting a check every month and every person we add to that list, those kids are statistically more likely to stay in school, more likely to graduate and you can all do the math. Our, uh, the funding statewide for child support uh, similarly was set uh, in the end of the Doyle administration. So what's the impact here locally? Uh, our child support uh, agency led by former state senator uh, Jim Sullivan, uh, who was there by the way when uh, the level was set uh, of funding for the agency he now runs, uh, their caseload, average caseload, 900 people per caseworker. And if that sounds like a lot, it's number one, I believe, in the United States. And they do a great job, but things fall apart. This is not tenable. So I could give you a lot of examples, but there's a very real world impact. Uh, and again, you know this. So back to the transportation budget. Uh, uh, because the wheel tax uh, is currently the only local revenue option available to local governments outside of a capped property tax, Milwaukee County has been forced to take on the unpopular option of increasing the wheel tax to avoid cuts to transit services uh, that thousands rely on. So the question is this. Are you comfortable with increased use of vehicle registration fees to support local transportation? Or do you believe we should be looking at other options like unfreezing state aid for local transit, increasing local gas taxes or vehicle miles traveled fees, 
uh, and would you support a policy to, ch uh, to change uh, a policy change to allow local municipalities to implement a progressive vehicle registration fee instead of the current flat fee? Uh, <laughs> and I think we'll start with Kelder. Are you up? Yeah. I think so. Uh, in 90 seconds. So. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, first, I I really want to take a minute, and I'm sure the Republicans are going to play footage of this and hit me on it. But I really want to applaud what Milwaukee County did because it is not easy to look at these very tough decisions that the state has put you in and say, are we going to cut transit, which people rely on and must have, and there's no other option? Or are we going to raise taxes on people? And we know it's going to be hard for some of them because these are the only options that are available to us. So thank you for taking on that really tough issue and grappling with it. We need leaders who are willing to do that, who are willing to have tough conversations with people, sit down at the table and work things out. Um, that's something that Wisconsin has done fairly well in the past, but not so much lately. And so, you know, we're number one in the number of cases that uh, child support agents have to deal with in Milwaukee, but we're number 49 or 50 in terms of the quality of our roads in the state. We need a governor who's going to put together a long-term infrastructure plan that includes local road aids, that has a modest adjustment to the gas tax and re-indexes it to inflation, and makes these high-capacity commercial vehicles that are really doing a number on our roads pay their fair share for the use of our roads. We need to let local communities band together for transportation and other things through regional transit authorities so that you can actually plan for the current and future needs of your communities. And we do need to look at more progressive taxation options as well as more state funding on these very complex issues. You can read more on my website since these are <laughs> very difficult to address all the Agreed. things you raised in 90 seconds. Thanks. Josh. Thanks. You know, I, I um, back when I first started college, I bought a car. I spent $500 on the car. And, you know, I paid the same registration fee as someone who bought an Escalade. <laughs> I think we should allow local communities to be able to have a progressive registration fee. And I think that's part of the broader scope of, of, once again, local control, giving cities the power to innovate, to do things to make transportation safe and available to everybody. And we go through, and there's all the, the, the big ideas that we can, we can implement, regional transportation authorities, allowing um, municipalities to, to raise to the right revenue services to, to fund for roads. But also, let's look at um, some new innovative ways, like allowing communities to pilot programs to bring rideshare to underserved low-income communities so that that last mile served is available you know, to, to people that need to get to a job and can't walk a long distance to a bus stop in the middle of winter. Um, some other cities are trying this. It's, you know, they provide a small subsidy for the, you know, $5 for a Uber pool ride, then, then the person only has to pay a dollar. I think these are type of innovative solutions that particularly here in Milwaukee we can do to, to both improve our transportation and reduce poverty. Uh, further than that, we need to have a long-term transportation plan that, that indexes the gas tax and looks at ways in which we treat our roads like utilities because people are using them. A lot of people from, not from Wisconsin are using them. And we need to understand how we broaden the, the, the fee base so that Wisconsinites aren't creating a larger and larger burden of paying for the roads that, that more people are using. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. Okay. You know, no one likes paying taxes, right? Um, but it's not about the taxes that you pay. It's about what is done with those tax dollars that we send to Madison. Because we're all going to pay taxes. That's just the reality of life. Like, government costs money. It costs money to move people around. But on one hand, you can't say, well, we want you to get a job and pick yourself up by your bootstraps. But then on the other hand, say, well, we're going to cut bus lines in the city of Milwaukee, and we're not going to be able to get you to those jobs, and, and you're not going to be able to afford to get there. So we have to realize what kind of society do we want to be in. And, you know, having the ability, like our governor does, to say that, you know what, I, I, you, your taxes haven't been raised by $28 last year. Well, that's all well and good, but if people can't get the jobs, if people can't actually get to work, then we're paying more by tax dollars by actually helping people. And I believe in my heart that most people want to be off government assistance. Most people actually want to work and have the dignity of work and actually provide for their families. And I don't believe that everyone believe, thinks that. So what I will do is I will set up a regional transit authority that will be, be uh, composed of local towers, a local sales tax, and ability for local uh, 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 elected officials to be able to raise their levy. Because having a 0% levy increase is not realistic. You can't 
pay for essential services without money. The only thing you can do is cut, cut, cut. And these austerity measures do not help us have a good quality of life for our citizens. So I will actually, we'll have to raise the taxes, but we'll do it so that we help everybody rise and everyone will have the freedom to thrive under a Mitchell administration. Thank you. Thank you. Matt? Here are my action items. The precise question was, uh, would I restore local control to let Milwaukee County and any county raise their registration fee? The answer is yes. I would restore local control across the board. Uh, the second thing is, would I restore local control to permit Milwaukee County and any county to have a progressive fee? So if somebody has a Maserati, they're going to pay a lot more than a 20-year-old used car. And the answer is yes. But what I want to do is to be able to incentivize local communities, starting in Milwaukee County, not to have to raise fees, not to have to raise our property taxes, which are way too high to begin with, for no, at no fault uh, of, of, of the county or the city, and to rely more and more on shared revenue state aids. And here's my plan for transportation budget. The, uh, we stopped indexing in 2005. It's been a disaster. We have to restore indexing of the gasoline tax. The fact is that it's a fee, not a tax paid for by tourists. I won't do tolls. About 23 cents of every dollar of tolls goes to administration. It's very inefficient. So the gas tax or uh, indexing is what's needed. Uh, in addition to that, the, the transportation budget right now in the state is about 20 percent debt service. So 20 cents in every dollar is paying off bonds or interest in the past. That's unsustainable. It's got to come way down. So we are going to index the, the gas tax. But the final thing that I'll say is this. Walker rated it to build roads for Foxconn to Chicago. That was wrong. That was wrong. A lot of that money is going to come back to Milwaukee for mass transit for our bus system. Thank you. And just as a uh, quick follow-up yes or no question, uh, would you support a policy change uh, that increases the minimum amount of state aid for local transit and indexes the future increases to inflation, essentially addressing an issue that I think all of you brought up? Yes or no? The answer is yes. 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 As part of a yeah. Long, yeah, longer term fix, yes. Yes. I kind of figured you have some consensus on that. Uh, so today we're here in uh, Ward 4, which is a co-location for uh, entrepreneurs and startups. Uh, one of our uh, other functions is a uh, venture capital fund, and we focused on startups in Milwaukee and growing jobs in Milwaukee, and we've had a lot of success without any public subsidy. None of that has required pulling tax dollars from education or transportation, and we've had some pretty marked success, enough to get interest from the administration to ask us, uh, current administration, about uh, working with us. So the question is this. What do you believe is the role, the proper role, of state government to spur economic development in Milwaukee? I think, Josh, you're first on this. Thanks. Um, you know, four out of five people, employees in Wisconsin work for a company that's 16 years or older. And all of the high wage jobs are in new companies, new industries. So we need a, uh, a new set of policies to encourage entrepreneurship and to bring high paying jobs to, to Wisconsin. Uh, it's often talked about the Kauffman Foundation's study that showed that Wisconsin was last in, this, in the country in new business growth. I should call the CEO of the foundation and we had a long conversation and we talked talked about well what's what are the best sets of things that we can do as a state what are things that aren't being done anywhere where we can innovate as a state to make wisconsin a great place to start a business and there's a whole lot of different great things you can do and some things you should not do as a state to encourage entrepreneurship and it starts with rethinking the way we approach encouraging new business growth the old model, the antiquated model of, of government support has different silos of agencies, complicated tax systems, licensing systems, different agencies, and the entrepreneurs and the, the people who want the jobs in the, the new economy, they're all at the bottom, and they have to try to navigate all these things. And the actual source of the government is, is far distant. <clears throat> what we need to do is bring those entrepreneurs up and empower them. We need to create a, a system that, that circulates and brings everyone together, encourages people to take risks, and provides them access to the capital. Too many women and minorities aren't able to start a business because they don't have the access to capital, and they don't have the, the friends, family, and fools 
uh, access to money that, that people get. We as a government can empower that to happen without using state corporate welfare money. Bailey? I've never heard friends, families, and fools. Yeah, you have now. All right, thank you, Josh, for that. Um, we are dead last in startups in our state. So uh, one thing I would do as your governor, I would make sure um, that we actually have startup incubators all across the state. I actually uh, talked to a young man that is opening one called Sherman Phoenix. That they're going to actually have a startup incubator on the north side of Milwaukee. Uh, I want to help that, and I want to I want to do something like that. Um, but the first thing we have to do is actually be real about this. And the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation is a massive failure, right? We need to bring back the Department of Commerce, actually get back to having an agency that helps. You can't clap that long; only got like a minute and thirty seconds. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to get rid of Weedick, bring back the Department of Commerce, actually have great oversight, have transparency, have accountability. Uh, but at the end of the day, we can, I want to start two agencies. One is actually a startup agency. And I want to have folks that normally wouldn't have the capital or the ability to actually start a business to have that ability. I also want to talk about economic growth, but only in 15 seconds. I'll tell you right now, we got to raise the minimum wage because the way we actually spur our economy, when people don't, that normally don't have money or the middle class has money, when they have more money, what do they do with it? They spend it. And when they spend more money, that means more goods and services have to be produced. That means more jobs have to be given. And that means we are going to stimulate our economy from the bottom up. And that's the only real way to actually get the state of Wisconsin running again. Thank you. The question is the role of the state in, in fostering private industry. And I will say this. First of all, I want to acknowledge Chris's contribution in doing this incubator. I've toured this incubator, and there are a number of very fine, smaller companies that are being developed here at no cost to the state. This is a terrific model, but it's not possible to replicate this in every county in the state. So WEDIC right now um, is basically a corrupt institution. This Foxconn deal is its bigger, biggest piece of corruption, which I will go to court to stop. But Scott Walker has given money to his donors many of whom didn't qualify, uh, many of whom didn't pay it back, and they never should have lent the money in the first place. It's just dead wrong. So it is going to be reconstituted under my watch, whether we call the Department of Commerce again, and my friend Corey Nettles was the, was the Secretary of the Department of Commerce is helping me in this, in this race, or we call it something else. But there will be unnegotiable integrity in a Flint administration and in Weedick. The other thing, however, is I do not look on the role of the state as being a partner in every business in this state. Kimberly Clark just lined up to be Foxconn. Everybody's lined up to be Foxconn. Under me, nobody's going to be Foxconn. And I'm not going to be con. What I'm going to provide is clean, clean water, honest government, strong public education, strong University of Wisconsin system, much lower tuition because we're going to fully fund it, statutory tenure, re re restatement of the mission statement. That's what I'm going to provide business in this state. Helga. So, first of all, let's talk about what doesn't work for economic development. We know corporate welfare doesn't work. And we know in the long term, polluting our natural resources and destroying them doesn't work. We know taking money out of the pockets and taking power away from working people doesn't work. And Wisconsin has been dead last in startups uh, for the last three years running. Um, I feel like I've beaten the odds because I had the opportunity to build a successful business. And uh, what we see working can work in every part of the state if we make a commitment not to big corporate welfare deals, but to helping homegrown innovators, whether it's a family <clears throat> farmer, whether it's somebody who wants to open a cafe on Main Street, or somebody who has an idea for an innovative small business. If we help them get access to capital, get technical support and resources, and if we equalize the playing field so that small businesses can actually compete against the big guys, especially for employees. As I talk to small business owners around the state, the thing I hear about all the time is health care. The cost of health care is extremely prohibitive to people leaving jobs to go start something, uh, to be able to retire, uh, to be able to go join somebody who has a small business. If we can make our benefits more portable, 
offer affordable health care coverage to everybody, open up Badger Care as a public option that anyone could buy into, make the Wisconsin Retirement System a portable benefit program that any Wisconsinite or any business could participate in and buy into, have universal paid family leave so anybody could have 12 weeks of family and medical leave, regardless of your employment, that's how we're going to build a strong economy well into the future. All right, uh, the next question. Uh, Milwaukee's 53206 zip code, which is 95% African American, has, as I suspect most of you know, the highest incarceration rate in the country, much higher unemployment than the rest of the county, and incredible challenges accessing quality jobs and education. Local officials have sought various state reforms to decrease these racial inequities, including expanding the use of expungement, uh, and uh, which, as you know, gives formerly incarcerated the ability to more easily find employment and reduces uh, recidivism. The question, as candidates on the Democratic side of the aisle, how would you work with local leaders as well as Democrats and Republicans in Madison to move the needle on the one issue that impacts Milwaukee more than any other racial inequities? Bailing, you're first. You know, we... Uh we have this question uh, every now and then in a lot of these forums, and uh, we, we have the opportunity to sit in democratic forums and forums around the state. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's funny, but it's actually not, because if you look around you right now, how many black and brown people are in the room right now? Not many. So the first thing I will do as governor is actually bring black and brown people to the table to actually talk about 53206, because that's what's going to actually change. Because a lot of people want to just, just talk about it, and then three and a half years later, let's talk about it again. Let's actually solve the problem and recognize that there's a real unfortunate issue in the state of Wisconsin. It's not a Republican problem. It's not a Democrat problem. It's a Wisconsin problem that we have to solve. We have the ability, unfortunately, to put about 16,000 people behind bars. We have close to 24,000 people in jail. So we're not going to ever solve or tackle racial injustice until we actually have economic justice. So until we bring, <laughs> until we bring incubators like this on the north side of Milwaukee or bring opportunities in Kenosha, Racine, Beloit, where black and brown people live, we will never solve these problems. We need to get rid of crimeless revocations. We need to get rid of truth and sentencing. We need to ban the box on applications, no doubt. But we need to actually have jobs and opportunities for people to work and pick themselves up by their bootstraps in order to actually get out and away from this problem. But we have to bring real stakeholders to the table, not just sit around and talk about it and it looks great, it sounds great, but let's bring people to the table that actually can get the job done. Thank you. Matt? Here are my specific action items on that. First of all, I will legalize marijuana for all purposes, medicinal, recreational, tax it, regulate it for people over 21. It's absurd to be giving people criminal convictions in Milwaukee for what's legal in Colorado. That's going to end, and when I'm in office, I'll have the biggest pardon board of any governor, and I will pardon anybody in the state who's there in a prison or a jail for a nonviolent possession offense. And I will expunge their records, because that was one of the biggest indicators and it's disparately in the various racial communities applied. I will close down the Milwaukee Secure Defense Detention Facility. I think that's been abused. I think it's unnecessary. And it's basically based on crimeless revocations. I will also get rid of um, uh, uh, solitary confinement, which I view as a form of torture. In other words, basically, for a day or two, an emergency is one thing, but long term is the other. But the other thing, more importantly, is I have spent time talking to some wonderful people in this town, Reverend Carruthers, Reverend Sibley, Reverend Donnie Sims, Bishop Daniels. These are good men. We have very good clergymen in this town. And they understand these issues acutely. I have learned from them. And I will be personally, since I'm keeping my house, be living in Milwaukee a lot. I will be continuing to attend services in their churches on Sunday as they invite me and to get their wisdom and counsel on these things. Ultimately, there are obviously an economic underlay to this, but a strong pro-reform, pro-criminal justice reform governor is exactly what we need. 
that'll do it. Chris, I think you are right. This is an issue that is the most challenging and the most urgent for Milwaukee, but it's also true in Madison and it's also true for our state as a whole. And I'm a mom of young kids and I don't wanna raise my kids in a state where kids who look like my kids have more opportunities than kids who look like Malin's kids. I think that's wrong. And we need a governor who understands that this is not a problem just of the criminal justice system. This is a problem that we need to start addressing with infant mortality. Something I started working on almost 15 years ago as head of NARAL Pro Choice Wisconsin. We need to make sure people have access to early childhood education. Not just kids whose parents can afford it, but especially uh, kids whose parents live in neighborhoods that are plagued by poverty and violence. We have to solve the issues of affordable, safe housing. Um, we need to make sure that there's never an opportunity gap that even gets to develop and fully and equitably fund our K-12 schools and make sure people have access to health care. And of course, we have to take aim at the criminal justice system. system. In fact, the Republicans and Scott Walker are attacking me on this very issue because I said, and I stand by it, we need to reduce, we need to aim to reduce the prison population in this state by half, just like Minnesota did. We're not more criminal than Minnesota. Give me a break. We are bankrupting ourselves financially and morally, and we need to take a comprehensive view to address the shame of Wisconsin, which is the racial disparities that make Wisconsin the worst place to raise a black child. We can do this if we have a governor who provides that leadership, who knows how to get things done, as I have done throughout my career. Thank you. Gosh. Thank you. We need real justice in this state. And one thing we need to understand is that we need to break down the, mis the misconceptions that exist across the state about, about what minority uh, communities are like. You know, I, um, when I was, I was working uh, several years ago, I brought a, a group of young people from northern Wisconsin down to Chicago. And uh, we, were, we were going on a, basically um, for a training trip. And one of the kids that, he was, he was raised in Rice Lake. And he'd only knew, known one black person his entire life. And he was in a minority south side of Chicago, and he, he told me, he's like, I've never seen a neighborhood like this before. And, you know, for too many people, they, they look at other communities like they're just this far distant, unrelated community, and they don't understand that they have shared experiences, and we need to empower them to, to understand that we were all in this together. So beyond empowering the communities and bringing in criminal justice reform, I've been advocating for a public service initiative here in Wisconsin. What we need to do is bring people from one part of the state to another part of the state to learn and to work and to understand that we're all in this together, to empower people, to bring them together, to have the, understand the shared experiences. You know, uh, generations ago, we had the World War II that brought class, race, everyone together to go and fight overseas and they came back and we had the civil rights movement. We need to do that, but not through a war. We need to do that by bringing people together through common service. And that's just one of many, many things we need to do in addition to, as governor, having a diverse administration and empowering and showcasing all the great works and businesses that come out of minority communities. So before I get to the last question, uh, Malin, because you asked about uh, the room, and that's a very uh, a good point. Uh, and also, I would echo as an ad, uh, the Sherman Phoenix is a great group. Uh, as I mentioned before, our venture fund, the national average for uh, percentage of women in minority-owned companies is collectively 13%. And one of the things I'm most proud about is we're at 62. Um, and what I love to follow up with, now ask me how good, they're, how well they're doing better than just about any fund in the country, or sorry, in the state, not yet the country, we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> but, so when people come room and they see events here, uh, it's a more diverse group and sometimes the question is, oh, you've got a lot of diverse employees and people don't catch themselves, so I get to say, those aren't the employees, those are the owners, but i will happy to introduce them. And then usually sometimes they don't want to be introduced, but I'm totally with you on that. Uh, so yeah, uh, the final uh, question, uh, uh, if elected, and I'm thinking this is going to be an easy one, uh, will you commit to working with Milwaukee County as a partner to work towards solutions to our fiscal problems that benefit both the state and Milwaukee County? Joe Hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. I live here. Okay. Oh. Yes, oh, yes. No, 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 that, that was just a, uh, that was just a yes or no. Uh,
We're just raising our hands. Just a yes or no. Yes or no. Okay, good. I got a few extra seconds in. I was born here. That's right. He was. I'm going to die here. All right. Well, once again, I, I want to thank everybody for showing up. I want to thank the candidates, and I want to say again, um, it's really great as a group to hear such thoughtful, detailed answers, and clearly the fact that you thought about this is something that's heartening, and as I said at the beginning, the fact that you're all still running has made absolutely a better and more informed race, and I'm grateful for it. So one more round of applause for our candidates. Well, Chris, thank you. Yeah.